Um, so this is, look, a really important one. The fourth industrial revolution is a concept which is, yeah, partially at least owned by the fourth industrial revolution, we, uh, by the World Economic Forum. We started talking about this in, in some detail around 2015 when our founder and executive chairman, Professor Clyde Schwab, wrote a book. Um, since then, it's, it informs a lot of our thinking. We believe the technologies uh, that, that, are, yeah, that are emerging now, such as AI and big data analytics and, and, and robotics, and all of those technologies are merging together and changing not only the future of our world, but also changing existing industries. But it's an important conversation, especially in the context of is it a, is it a good uh, policy instrument to advance on these technologies when other priorities, so many priorities, across economic and societal uh, policy areas exist. So I'm going to rush through the panel because we have a very short time for this one. Alison Gilward is uh, from Research ICT Africa. Then we have uh, Ian Oluwu Abayeji. Uh, you were from Flutterwave recent, until recently, but now you work on Future Africa, which is a privately backed development fund. You're funding the entrepreneurs of the future. Uh, Ange Tuku Shangwei, you're from Afro's Transformational Games, a uh, digital Hi, learning organization. Uh, David Sangway, you're the Chief Innovation Officer for Sierra Leone and advisor to the President. So a glittering cast. Um, Alison, you, you wrote a, a skeptical piece um, recently, so I think we should really start with you. Um, there is nothing <laughs> inherent in so-called 4IR technologies that will necessarily result in economic growth, job creation, or empowerment of the marginalized. Very important, bearing in mind the theme of this meeting, which is inclusive growth and shared futures, and, and you know, using technology as a tool for societal as well as economic good. Um, so explain a little bit about your thinking around that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, so I, I um, work with an uh, African think tank called Research ICT Africa. And um, at the University of Cape Town at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance um, on a digital economy um, and society doctoral program. So my perspective is really a, a policy perspective on this. And it's very much an African perspective um, on this. And we've been working in the area of ICT, uh, policy and regulation, telecom originally, and ICT, and now, of course, the challenges of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. Because a part of this critique from an academic point of view is that it really glosses over and appropriates a really significant body of literature that comes from the contractive wave that were, you know, wave that was the first reference to the um, industrial revolution with advanced capitalism and new technologies, and of course made popularized by Schumpeter around innovation and as a kind of core theory of innovation. But you know, it's a very specific um, uh, 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 policy lessons to be learned from these that could be um, extrapolated to you know, new technologies as they're arising. And some of these are, of course, around the disruption of these new technologies, and also around the interests that and coalesce around these technologies. And these, you know, these technologies have always coalesced around you know, big capital of the day, um, industrial capital you know, of, 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 of the second and third industri uh, second re industrial revolution. And then, of course, with the so-called third industrial revolution, although that's not quite the sequencing in the quantitative waves, um, the uh, big capital associated with uh, you know, uh, digital, digital um, and telecom and that kind of thing that was happening. So um, from this literature, what we actually see is that, of course, there, dis there are disruptions, but there is also incredible evolution. And there are enormous continuities. And one of the continuities is actually um, inequalities that are, that are continuous throughout this. So the benefits that accrue from these, although in the longer term, the benefits of electrification or you know, um, uh, ICTs do accrue, to the masses indirectly, even if they don't have direct access to them, it actually is, at the moment, exacerbating inequality. And I think this is one of the central you know, uh, policy challenges uh, globally, but particularly for developing countries, this digital inequality paradox, that in fact, the more we um, overlay advanced technologies mm -hmm. on existing structural inequalities, mm -hmm. the greater the gap gets. And that's not only between those offline and online, but between those who are able to um, you know, use this, these technologies for their own well-being, for prosperity, mm -hmm. for advancement of certain things. So, yeah. so, you're, so your critique, and I'm just mindful of time, so yeah. that's very good. So your critique is, is that 
this uh, disruption is an ongoing evolution rather than a, a new industrial epoch, and that, that, that it's, the, it's the continuation of, of inequality that is the, one of the greatest challenges and, and problems associated with this uh, labeling of the fourth industrial revolution. Well, it's that, but also that um, the way that the fourth industrial revolution has been marketed, mm -hmm. I mean, probably one of, as I said, the most successfully um, lobbied and marketed um, uh, you know, instruments of our, of our time, um, is that it's completely preoccupied governments, and developing country governments as well, mm -hmm. um, and distracted them from addressing these existing inequalities that are in fact creating the preconditions that are necessary for us to harness the benefits so of the fourth a, industrial revolution. That's, the, that's a very well understood point. So your, 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 your worry here is that talk of the fourth industrial revolution is a gloss um, that is distracting people from the real substantive issues that you know, underlie inequalities. So we've got a, a, a really interesting mix here. We've got a, a venture financer, we've got a, you know, a entrepreneur who's you know, got her own business, and we've got an invest, you know, some, a guy who invests government. government. So, <laughs> so I'm going to call you I because you told me that was e. okay. Yeah. E. yeah, everyone so, calls me E. So call me E. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm going to call you E. Let us know from, from your perspective. You've just moved from being a startup, an entrepreneur yourself. Now you're investing in, in others. Yeah. And this is a, this is a, a real problem. We have uh, millions entering the job market yeah. every year in Sub-Saharan Africa. And yeah, we know that you know, factory floor jobs are, are not going to be increasing in the way they have in other regions as they industrialize in Asia and elsewhere. So we need to find work, uh, yeah. good quality work, to, to reduce the inequality we know exists. Um, do you have confidence in the fourth industrial revolution to do that? Um, so, I mean, my perspective, um, in some ways it's similar to hers in the sense that absolutely the fourth industrial revolution as a practical focus for governments may not necessarily be the wise approach to take. However, I think one thing it's helpful to understand um, about the fourth industrial revolution as I see it and the relationship between that and inequality is that this for the first time, and, and that's the magic of the fourth industrial revolution, is the only time when the critical factor of production is simply labor. For the first time, you have labor as the critical factor of production. When you talk about the fourth industrial revolution, the most important element, which I think most people in this conversation miss, is talent. Talent that is able to absorb these concepts and leverage them to create change in the society. I don't consider myself just capital. I consider myself activist capital. So when we apply capital to companies, we apply capital not just because we want returns. That's a byproduct of applying the capital. We apply the capital to level society and to leverage the startup's innovation, innovation capacity to be able to scale very quickly innovations that give everybody access to a life that is both going to guarantee them purpose and prosperity. Understanding that critical point about the fourth industrial revolution is the starting point for this conversation about talent. And the work that I've done with Andela, you know, when we started Andela in 2014, we were walking into an ecosystem where software engineers were not valued and they did not exist. However, these were value, globally valuable skills. The local elites obviously boosted by this general idea that the fourth industrial revolution is not important, so it's a marketing gimmick for taking more money out of the system and pretending to do any kind of work, um, um, did not take us seriously. However, within a four-year period, we had built um, uh, several hundred million dollars of value, educated over 100,000 young people in basic software engineering skills, and opened them up to the global economy. This is something that was not possible to do in other industrial revolutions. It was not possible for you to sit in your bedroom in Lagos and work for multinationals all over the world. That's and this is the first time. To, no, no, I, but, but, but I think what's important <laughs> is also understanding, well, well, well you, could, you could call it the third industrial revolution, but think about all the ways that in the fourth industrial revolution, that capacity translates from simply being um, simply the ability for you to just service multinationals, but the ability to create your products from anywhere. You have biogenetics, the ability to do this from anywhere. What funding company is doing biogenetics in Nigeria? So I think it's a little bit, um, um, I think it's a little paternalistic to say, oh, Africa, you don't deserve, it just exacerbates the inequality, in my opinion. Why 
not invest in the talent in Africa. There's AI talent that's world class in Africa. There's biogenetics talent that's world class in Africa. There's 3D printing talent that's world class in Africa. There is engineering talent that's world class in Africa. Why not AWS, which is cloud, one of the elements of the fourth industrial revolution was invented here in Cape Town. So the question is, why are we not elevating the talent on these platforms to global standards and creating a global market for our talent as we move into this new era? Why are we talking to just investing in governments who don't know what the hell these things are, investing time in educating them instead of educating people? I'm loving the, I'm loving the look here from our government. Yeah, instead, of, instead, of, instead of investing in the talent that has to deliver on this promise of the fourth industrial revolution. I, I mean, I, I appreciate the work Senge does, but what I'm saying is the focus is often misplaced. The leaders of the fourth industrial revolution are not government or academia. They are young African talent, hungry for opportunities to participate in a global economy. And okay. the fourth industrial revolution is their best chance. So we're going to so we're gonna leave it there for now. It's a very good point well made. So basically, yeah, you're, 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 you made an eloquent case of the fourth is different from the third because it's, it's empowering to individuals. It doesn't quite get to the point of inequality, but it does give people with talent the opportunity to get themselves a, a leg up. So Anne, maybe you could kind of take it from there. Yeah. Um, you, I know you work a lot with, with women as well, and so that's a very important angle. Again. It's the inequality and it's the 4IR and it's how to kind of harness the technology so that we don't leave either of those uh, you know, in the, at a disadvantage. Let me just say that like uh, E, uh, I, I'm a Kenyan so I have a day job and I have a night job. So my day job really right now is that I run United Nations Women um, and that's why I have this very strong gender equality uh, lens but also um, as a social entrepreneur, my social entrepreneurship was focusing very much on the issues of gender inequality in the first instance. So, um, you know, I think the big thing for us is that the fourth industrial revolution, if it goes ahead in its current form, the data is that it will take us 217 years in the current pace at which we interact in society for gender equality. But with the, in, the, in the fourth industrial revolution, it will take us 700 years. So the exclusion of women, it's a conversation that E is having, uh, you know, and it's a few, you know, it's, it's young people, um, it's people who are in the city centers, but many, 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 many young, uh, you know, women across the African continent are not even participating by any means in this conversation. So we have all kinds of data that is basically showing us that you know, where you've got increasing um, engagement, uh, apart from, uh, from Kenya, where I come from, where more and more women have had access to an M-Pesa, but in most other economies, that's just not happening. And so the exclusion of women is an issue that we have to pay very close attention to. Otherwise, there's no revolution whatsoever. And it's a revolution that is assuming that we have an, a world that is completely apart from the world that is pushing forward with the fourth industrial revolution. And we you had an issue briefing this morning. Else. Sorry, forgive me for uh, interrupting, but we had an issue briefing on, on uh, gender-based violence this morning. It was a smaller session as part of our original program. We upgraded it. We needed to get that in front of the live cameras, as we are now, by the way. Um, and, and one of the takeaways from there was that they believed that technology had, a, had a, a positive role to play in helping empower women. It sounds like you're not quite so uh, confident that is, the, that's, that is what's been happening so far. I mean, there, it, there, there are different, there, of course. I mean, my, my mother, my grandmother, I'm from Kenya. My mother and my grandmother have leveraged technology. They have mobile phones. My grandmother pays her, her, um, her farm workers uh, using her mobile phone through, through M-Pesa. So we've got some good stories. But we also have a lot of stories that are basically showing that the gap. So, so in other words, exactly what Alison is saying. We cannot assume that if we have a policy that is saying, you know, we are going to have access to technology, that everybody has equal access to that technology. They don't. The inequalities um, that exist in soci society are pervasive and they, they play out in the same way with technology. So my point is that the effort that needs to take place if we're going to bring women on board the, it, the, there has to be a specific investment to ensure that that equity happens. And one big example, and we've been studying the, you know, where, where, is, where are there resources within governments for governments to actually move um, the, the, the industrial revolution or the internet even just to women. And what we found is that, you know, every government has un universal service agency funds, right, that come from your telecoms companies. We did a study that found that there's about $400 million that is unspent in Africa. 
and that is money that could be used to just bring those who are excluded into the industry, into this, this, this whole technology world. But it's not being used, and it's not being used, and we are calling, we've been calling as UN Women to say, at least 50% of this has to go into specifically bringing women um, into, the, into the fourth industrial revolution. How are you spending money, very briefly? So, different things. Educating girls, think of hidden figures, making sure that we're educating as many girls as possible, bringing them into the coding world, um, bringing women farmers so that they're able to access the technology, women who are um, trade, women traders, they're, they're still using old archaic systems that could enable them to move much faster, much, much cheaper, uh, be able to actually market their products in much easier ways. So the question is just how do we connect them? And what's interesting for us is if you do a study of what happens when men are uh, introduced to technology. They immediately leapfrog to the kind of future technologies we're thinking about. If you start thinking about how do we train women, we're back to the old sort of uh, uh, basics, you know, word, you know <laughs> word perfect and what did we call it before? Yeah, basic training. So it's really, really, really basic for women. Um, and then on this issue of gender-based violence, I think one of the things that we've seen is that we have to be, pay attention to what misinformation is doing. Uh, techn there are technologies that have been put on the table that are very useful safety for safety and security. And you know, those are useful to be able to, to, to provide warnings and so on. But what we're finding is that a combination of misinformation, fake news, and um, hate speech is actually flooding the environment as well. So, so part of it is not for me, I'm not saying let's not, let's not push forward with the benefits of it, but as we do so, recognize what the inequalities are and recognize what is happening. Cybercrime is a massive problem for young girls. And so this issue of, um, of GBV and in, in South Africa is something that uh, is luring a lot of young girls into this environment. And it's, and it's one of the actions so we, we want to take to away be, from this meeting is yeah. to get the tech, tech you know, the tech industry around the table and figure out how we can help. Because we had some very simple interventions they could make to help, but there's also some issues that they need to help us, us resolve if we're going to improve society. Uh, but let's move on. David, how easy is it for you to find time in your, your president's busy schedule to talk about the fourth industrial revolution? How confident are you that he buys into any notion that the 4IR will, will solve societal as well as economic problems? See, I wasn't told that I was going to come to a panel and be traumatized by what I hear. <laughs> uh, but I feel like what both of you said is as far away from what we need to be thinking about as could possibly be. You said that it's a distraction for government to be thinking about 4IR, that um, government might not be focused on this, uh, this shouldn't be government's priority. There's, there's nothing more appropriate and better to close inequality than 4IR. Like, there is, it's, it's, it's like saying when there was uh, 2IR and 3IR, African government should have been focused on slavery and decolonization, which is what they told us to do. And then we let other people uh, uh, invent computers ahead, yeah. and, and use computers. Because African governments were supposed to focus on democracy. And we're supposed to focus on how we uh, uh, deal with post-colonization. They didn't tell us to invest in, uh, in, in uh, computation. Mm. Because we weren't supposed to do that. The, the idea that we could possibly still in, in today be talking about whether it's appropriate for African governments to be doing 4IR it's almost repulsive because I'm an African government person and I sit in government and I use 3D printing with the president of Sierra Leone to look at where girls are not in school and we use that data printed in front of us to look at the spikes and figure out how we do distribution of school buses because I sit in the, the president's office and we, 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 we talk about uh, AI and blockchain and how uh, we can use EKYC for women who don't have banks because the mm. banks are only mm. uh, uh, using cards and these women are not going to get it to, to, to be able to access financing. I, uh, I'm driving, uh, uh, having a drone corridor because we need to use satellite imagery and ground truth data that is not present in Africa. And so we're building models on data that the European Space Agency has at NASA to go and predict forest cover and loss in Africa. So it is repulsive to, to be a government person and, uh, and, and get told that we should not be thinking about uh, uh, 4IR because it's not a priority. There's nothing that is more important for us as African governments and African leaders to begin to understand how we use the technologies of blockchain, of 
drones, of 3D printing, because you know, the US is not leading us far away and China is not leading us far away. So if we're not thinking about that now and we have to think about it in 50 years, where will we be? And so when it comes to who should be doing it, I think the, 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 the risk remains, the challenges remain, and the inequality is going to be there. That is why we need to have girls coding. That is why we need to have young people coding. That is why the people in government should be young people. So yes, the president of Sierra Leone, I can text him from wherever I am, and the composition that I texted him today was how we're going to use data and for IR to lead our people. And he engages on that. And yes, the president of Sierra Leone today will ask me to go and do a four-hour presentation to the rest of his cabinet because he understands that it is important that that's the only way we're going to solve Sierra Leone's problems. How do we address maternal mortality that's the highest in Sierra Leone? We don't go and say, let's just sit down and have a conversation about family planning because that's what happens. And you know that if people are having fewer babies, that's fine. But we can and should use the digital data that we have for all of our health facilities and figure out what AI models tell us how women should have access, what USSD solutions we build to tell women when they don't know when to go to health facilities to go there, to be able to use USSD to find their nearest hospitals. Absolutely. That's what we should be doing. It's a, it's a, it's a fine representation of a, of, a, of a forward looking government. I, I applaud you. How many other governments <laughs> across Africa do you believe have the, this level of, of, of sophistication? It should be all of them. It should so, be. So they should go to E and, and they are young people. And, and so if the president of Sierra Leone did not say uh, uh, six months ago, I need to have a chief innovation officer and said, how many other African governments are doing it? He would not have done it. But because he did it, and because I can sit here, because Bogolo exists, because the Minister of Finance in Mali exists, because the Minister of Paula exists from Rwanda, because we exist, that is why we have to amplify these success stories mm. so that other African co governments are doing it. So they are already. The only reason why they are not doing it is because we, we second guess them. It's because we, 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 we can't <laughs> sit there. That's not why. True. No, I'm uh, sorry. No, we, we, well, we have to. Because because we do need to respond. But first yeah. of all, let's just see. Because we, we always, when it gets fun, we run out of time too quickly. Anybody want to throw anything in from the audience? Just uh, any hand grenades you want to just chuck onto the stage? Verbal ones, of course. <laughs> no, all right. We're, 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 all right, we're entertaining you enough. Okay, so who goes first? Yeah. Alison, you go Sorry, first. I just wanted to say, um, you know, I think it's repugnant as an African, as a citizen, that there are discussions around sort of advanced technologies. In South Africa, at CISIR, we've got the biggest 3D printer um, in the world, but we actually have 50% of our citizens offline, and that is way higher than many of the other countries in Africa. What we're talking about here is absolutely critical. We have to address issues of fourth industrial revolution, the potential of artificial intelligence, of blockchain, of all of these things. Of course, we don't have the luxury of dealing with the other things first before we deal with this. But we cannot prioritize these issues while we were sitting throughout the continent with internet penetration levels of below 15 and 20 percent, below the critical mass that you need in order to get economic development. That we're sitting with a structural inequality that means that women are unprivileged because that is what drives internet take up. They are prevented from getting education, they are prevented from getting employment. We've got governments that are putting social networking taxes on our um, on, you know, poor people gaining access to the internet because that's the cheapest way that they can gain, the in gain access to the internet. Speaking about, you know, um, drones and things, absolutely the drones can do the agricultural delivery of, um, you know, um, uh, medicines in, in Rwanda. But you, at the same time, you have to address the fact that of the countries surveyed by Research ICT Africa in 2018, it had the lowest internet penetration rate, despite being, you know, so forward-looking in so many other ways. So, so, so you're, you're, you're looking for a, a fundamental stru structural issue such as internet penetration. And and that's, that's I mean, I'm not debunking artificial intelligence. I'm saying absolutely we but, have to but look get at the that. basics first. But we've got to be addressing these well, other things. Get Otherwise, the fundamentals. But, but can I, can I say something? I, okay. I, think, I think there is a challenge here which is that we think we're all saying different things, but we're not. What, what, what exactly what's happening is, first of all, you need to understand that these challenges are wicked problems. They're not, they're not static, they're evolving. You have to leapfrog to solve them. You, you cannot not solve maternal mortality issues by leveraging big data. That said, and this is a problem that even David would agree with me on, what talent are you using to do these things? Are these Sierra Leoneans? Yes, entirely? absolutely Sierra Leoneans. Now, have you had to train, train them? Yes. Exactly. Now, yes. at scale, at scale, 
at scale because this is where the inequality issues come from. The Syrian unions like you have gone to MIT, they've gone to Harvard, they've gone to Stanford. They are privileged, right? The average Syrian union child, the average South African child cannot read. How are we going to use 4IR technologies to tackle that challenge? Because if you tell me, and, and look, it's not, it's not one or the other, perhaps it has to be both, but we have to be absolutely clear about what problem we are solving. But you know, we so, have... Services, Ms. Fassi, we're... Know, yeah, Anna, I want you no, to make gonna, a comment. Yeah, I was just going to say that, in truth, uh, we're the ones who have to figure out how to simplify the technology so it's accessible for everybody. And, I, you know, I go back to my M-Pesa story. If my grandmother can actually pay people and communicate with me here, sitting in, in, in Mount Kenya, it is possible to do. If farmers who are in rural areas are able to, I mean, let's not dumb our, 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 uh, our, our country mates, you know? Just because people are, dis are disadvantaged in terms of access of education. I think the challenge for us, and this is a lot of the work that we've been trying to do, is to actually say, how do you simplify this and structure it in a way that can create the access? So instead of dumbing women when you train them in technology and assuming that the only thing they can do is sort of basic learn how to type kind of thing, but actually start saying to them, this is how big data works. And this, you know, and just use USSD technology, that works as well. So it is possible to meet the, this inequality. I think it just, my big point was, there just has to be a seriously deliberate effort to do it. Uh, there I'm, has to be a serious investment in doing it. Uh, and execution and, yeah. and urgency are the two watchwords of this meeting so far. Every single session, it's all about action, it's all about, it's about executing now, it's about implementation, rather yeah. than just, just talking. Yeah. That's, we're an action-oriented organization, so that, that works for us. Um, because we're running so far out of time, I think it's been a very valid discussion. Um, you know, we we know that the forefront of revolution to, technologies, if not its concept as, a, as an entirely separate industrial epoch, are happening. We know inclusive growth is necessary. We know inequality is unacceptable. So I'm just going to finish off by asking each of you just to make uh, one policy description, one intervention, which is the most important thing for Africa to adapt and thrive in the, in the, the era of the fourth industrial revolution technologies. David, over to you. Uh, but keep so, it brief. Right. So the UADF is an example that could actually be used to spread connectivity. So connectivity access, that can happen. I think the one fundamental policy is we have to believe in our people. As illiterate as we are, Sierra Leone has high horrible illiteracy levels, and the results just came out about 90% of our students failed the national exam. <laughs> as failing as they are, as poor as we are, as horrible as we are in the terms that we're the worst in maternal mortality, it is precisely because of that that our people have to be brought on to code, mm. to think computationally, to solve the problems that we have using technologies that all of us have access to. Everybody can have access to a mobile. Let's figure out functional ways to give them connectivity, mm. even if it's policy ways. Let's figure out a way to reimagine our educational systems um, such that they're not getting fields to, to, uh, in English language, if they can think computationally and problem solve. And let's just believe in ourselves. This is about us, and we can believe in ourselves, and we can lead. That belief is the fundamental thing we can do. Belief mm. in, in the potential for leadership, and Every girl child must learn how to code. Every single girl child must be embedded in the system. That's the one. The second one is... The resources are there. They're just not being pr uh, prioritized to, to deal with the inequality in access. So if I would say that of that 408 million, and I'm sure it's more this year, I would put 100% of it to really identify who are the most marginalized and how do we invest in their access and their internet access now. It's possible to do. We have the, we have the technology to do Girls, it. women are the most marginalized and yeah. re reallocating resources to yeah. focus on them. Yeah. I um, I, I love the other policy suggestions. My, mine would be we need to liberalize our universities mm -hmm. and encourage private sector to go do the research with 4IR to solve our problems at scale. While at the same time, which is why we need to do it in universities, providing a global pipeline of 4IR talent. We only have people in Africa. We don't have natural resources that the world wants anymore, right? All we have is a huge population of young people who are eager for opportunities, and 4IR is their best opportunity 
for us to have the next CEO of the next Microsoft, the next Google, the next whatever, come from Africa and position us just as India has positioned its, 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 its talent as a source of understanding for this new technology. We miss this, we miss it forever. It's not a bad endowment. I'll just say one comment that David Wong from Alibaba said yesterday on this in this room. We were talking about the Africa Growth Platform and an initiative. We launched this, this meeting to, to help improve and drive entrepreneurial startup businesses. And he said that when he was talking to Jack Ma about Africa, it's the most excited he's been since he set up Alibaba. He sees a huge, he sees a, a huge marketplace, a huge consumer marketplace, a population of over a billion bigger than China in a few years' time. So you're not the only people who have faith in Africa. People from outside the region do too. Alison, last word for yourself. Thank you. And we're keeping you behind. Apologies for your, your delay that we're making let's, you uh, let's, let's, your mate. Yeah, I'm going to dash off. But I, I absolutely agree. I think that you know, the major cause of our structural inequality is education and unequal education. Mm -hmm. And it's really it's something we have to address. While I think it's absolutely critical that we get the skills that we need for the third and fourth blurred industrial revolution um, and that you know coding for girls and coding for people who haven't had um, employment up to now is a fabulous thing I think if Harambe's here they do a fantastic job of linking you know 500,000 um, potential job uh, um, earners with, with 50,000 companies so wonderful opportunities to cre um, create um, skills where, where the market needs them often the content hasn't identified them but I think actually you know just returning to your point about uh, uh, public education um, what we need is actually public investment in our, in our institutions so that we can actually develop appropriate African evidence for policy. Why we accept these blueprints um, on assumptions about competitive, mature markets, effectively regulated markets, institutions with capacity to, um, to regulate, um, you know, also, is because we don't actually have the evidence and data of our own, um, and increasingly, as we move into a data environment with a datafication of you know of, of, of the economy, actually getting control of this data, owning this data, and governing this data um, is going to become increasingly important. And it's really our core asset in our environment. Knowledge and data is what is going to drive um, our ability to harness these these advanced technologies. Knowledge, data, women, the most marginalised, uh, all together. Put it all together. And believe in yourself and it will be a successful future Africa. Thank you so much for joining us at short notice. Thank you for joining us here in the room. Thank you for watching us live online. <laughs>